be in the kind of Nigerian email territory of 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, there certainly are people who get drawn into quite ridiculous uh, scams, and that, that does surprise me when when you hear about that. I guess uh, people are just curious, and they, they, they follow it on the off chance that there's something legitimate in it, and then once they're drawn in, then they, they're, they're targeted quite uh, aggressively by the scammers, and it's difficult to... Or it, it feels difficult to exit it. But most of the scams we see people falling for now are pretty complex. They're using uh, pretty personalised information and approaches, so... They're not, you know, not typically falling for those kinds of scams. And, you know, if, if the right scam hits you at the right time, it can be difficult to spot that it is a scam. What happens when you click on links, especially now, as uh, Lizzie and Peter are saying, when they don't seem to be rogue links, they seem more and more genuine. This is frightening. Yeah, I mean, if you click on a link and you go wherever the link takes you, then there are a bunch of options. I mean, sometimes they just take you to websites that are, you know, just fake sites where they're hoping to get you to buy something. Sometimes they'll take you somewhere specifically to trigger the download of you know viruses or malware onto your computer um there are in actual fact you know quite a few options available to them and uh, mostly they're thwarted by a decent security software but but uh, sometimes not the new zealand herald reports a couple poured 230k into a fake investment scheme after being duped by a sophisticated website that showed incredibly promising returns uh, Martin, I suppose what many of us don't understand is we do understand the initial allure, but shouldn't the warning bells be just deafening when you're asked for large sums of money? Uh, well, the, I guess the important thing to recognise is that uh, these scammers are running a scam which is going to relieve these people of $200,000. And for the scammers, that's $200,000 of net profit. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they, mm. all they've got to do to take that money is provide what looks like all of the infrastructure for an investment company. And so even people who are regular investors, you know, often say after they've been drawn into an investment scam, you know, there were no flags that looked exactly like legitimate investments that they've got. So, and of course, because the scammers don't, I mean, they don't have to do anything except fake being a, a company. So, yeah, we do see losses like that and, and they are quite devastating. I mean, it's, it's you know, people's life savings in, in yeah. some cases. Martin, I've got a question here about the role of the banking sector when, when people are making these big transfers uh, maybe out of character to offshore sources, the banks yeah. must be able to trace that. Do they play any role in being an early warning system here or do they just sort of turn a blind eye to it? Uh, they do sometimes. I mean, if uh, if you or I tried to transfer $200,000 to investment, I'm assuming, Peter, mm. they mm. don't make those kind of investments no. every day, the, the bank might flag it as an unusual transaction uh, and, and then come to us and say, is that a legitimate transaction? But in most cases, we're going to say, yes, it is. We've chosen to, to transact that money. And the bank will say, well, that, that's been, therefore your decision. Uh, they tend to be very good at picking up on uh, fake um, attempts to transact on your credit card and so forth. Uh, but when you are the one choosing to send the money, it's harder for the bank to intervene. Mm. So where are we going with this? Is it just going to get so sophisticated that we will really be in peril every time we go online and wonder whether the links are genuine and so on? Uh, well, we are, we are to some extent in peril every time we go online, not to overstate it, but, but we certainly have to remain vigilant at all times because, you know, like I say, scams are getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, the future is probably really a, a focus on two things, on education and disruption. So if we can disrupt the scammers and we can educate people, uh, you know, that's a better way to actually reduce scam losses than, than focusing a lot of resources on enforcement. All right, Martin, thank you. I didn't get time to address your question, Peter, but another day. Peter Dunn, thank you for being on the panel today. Thank you, Jim. And Lizzie Marvelly, you too. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Jim. Nice to see you too. And we are back tomorrow. Checkpoint follows. Thanks, everyone. Kia ora, good evening and welcome to Checkpoint. I'm Rowan Quinn, in for John Campbell. Tonight on the programme, New Zealand First forces Labour to U-turn on its plans to repeal the Three Strikes Law. The Gisborne region prepares for more heavy rain tonight, with between 150 and 200 millimetres expected over the next 24 hours. All eyes are on Singapore ahead of tomorrow's historic summit between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and US President Donald Trump. Meanwhile, the G7 summit ends in disarray, with Mr Trump's advisers accusing Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of stabbing the US in the back. And it's official, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex will visit New Zealand in October.
RNZ News at 5. No, my Heidi Mai. Good evening. I'm Paul Brennan. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is downplaying any disagreement within the government over criminal justice reform. The Justice Minister Andrew Little has been forced to back down from his plans to repeal the three strikes law after failing to secure New Zealand First's support to do so. National says the about turn is an embarrassing display of the government's incompetence, but Ms Ardern rejects that. All of these things are a matter of discussion for each of us as members of the government. As I say, three strikes makes up only a very small part of a much wider agenda and we're continuing to pursue that agenda as a government. Jacinda Ardern says all the government parties agreed that the justice system isn't working and are committed to its reform. The government will declare damage caused by last week's heavy rain near Tolaga Bay on the east coast a medium-scale adverse event. The Gisborne District Council estimates it will cost at least $10 million to clean up the forestry debris strewn across roads and properties by flooding in the area. The Prime Minister says a request has been made to the government to declare a medium-scale adverse event and it will do so. Meanwhile, Civil Defence says rivers could rise faster than usual tonight in the region and elsewhere because they are still high from last week's severe rainfall. Med Service has issued a heavy rain warning for Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and the Kaikoura Ranges. A wind warning is also in place for Bay of Plenty, Taranaki, Manawatu Whanganui, Topo and Kapiti. A week ago, Tolaga Bay, north of Gisborne, was hit with 200 millimetres of rain in 24 hours, causing serious flooding and evacuations. Tairafati Civil Defence spokesperson Paul Stewart says emergency services are already on standby. Your catchment's already saturated, and then that potentially means that the rivers may come up quicker. There could be more issues with the lights or slips. And with the wind, there's also the potential for power outages. So certainly those are things that you take into account that basically, OK, we've had an event last week, so that could compound. Tairafati Civil Defence spokesperson Paul Stewart there. Donald Trump has continued his attacks on his G7 partners with a new round of tweets after withdrawing support from the closing communique of the G7 summit minutes after it was published, the US president has turned his fire on NATO. He's claimed the United States paid close to the entire cost of the defence organisation, protecting many countries which, in his words, rip off the US on trade. The BBC's John Sopel reports. The president plans to spend the rest of the day with his advisers in preparation for tomorrow's summit. But if his Twitter account is anything to go by, he seems more preoccupied by what went down at the G7 summit in Quebec, complaining about America being ripped off by unfair trade deals and demanding that EU countries pay more into NATO. John Sopel in Singapore. A detective has told a court that a website that supplied a cheating service to students must have known what was going on. The Commissioner of Police is asking the High Court in Auckland to order Assignments for You, website bosses Steve Kwan Lee and his wife Fan Yong, to forfeit more than $4.6 million, it says, is proceeds of crime. Edward Gay reports. Detective Craig Smith confirmed under cross-examination from Stephen Kwan Lee and Fan Yang's lawyer, David Jones QC, that the students who used the website were the principal offenders. He also said he didn't know of any students who used the website having been prosecuted by the police. But Mr Smith said the website operators knew the assignments were going to be turned in as the students' own work. The hearing before Justice Wolford has been set down for four weeks. Itamaki Makoto called Edward Gayaho. A lifeline could be on the way for a cancelled air service between Paraparaumu and Auckland. Early in April, Air New Zealand stopped flying between the two centres. On Thursday, the Kapiti Coast District Council will consider subsidising Air Chathams so it can get the service operating again. Royalists throughout New Zealand are gearing up for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's first official visit, which was announced today. Kensington Palace has confirmed Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, will visit New Zealand as part of, its, uh, part of their first overseas trip in October. The visit coincides with the Invictus Games in Sydney. It also includes stops in Fiji and Tonga. Whangarei woman and long-time royal supporter Shirley Faber is ecstatic about news of the visit. We need some joy in our lives, really. And he is our prince, New Zealand's prince, and he's just been married to a beautiful girl. All those things are positive things, and he exudes positivity and caring, and that's why I'm excited.
and that's Whangarei woman Shirley Faber. Stewart Island is one step closer to establishing an approved dark sky sanctuary. The Stewart Island Raki Ura Community Board has unanimously agreed to ask the Southland District Council to investigate an official bid to become a sanctuary. The board will ask the council to consider new bylaws or changing district plans to meet international dark sky association standards. The board chairman, John Spraggan, says the application could be submitted in July. It's five minutes past five. On to sport now. The French player Bernard Leroux says the All Blacks didn't cheat and were the better team in Saturday's first test in Auckland. In post-match comments, he has since retracted. French coach Jacques Brunel said a nasty facial in injury to winger Remy Grosso was the result of illegal tactics by the home side. Asked today what he made of that assessment, South African-born Leroux says France were outplayed. You know, I just thought they were brilliant on the ball, off the ball, and like I said, uh, all around the park they were brilliant. That's rugby, and it's all about the small detail and working hard with the ball and without the ball, and that's what they do really well, so no, I've got nothing to say about that. French player Bernard Leroux. The Canadian driver Lance Stroll has reacted diplomatically to the incident which took him out and New Zealand's Brendan Hartley on the first lap of Formula One's Canadian Grand Prix. Hartley's been released from hospital after precautionary checks and race stewards deemed neither driver was at fault, with Stroll saying it was simply a racing incident. Unfortunately, I was racing side by side with Brendan uh, into turn five. The car got loose on me, I corrected it, but there wasn't enough room for both of us. And uh, by the time I corrected it, we made contact and then went into the wall. Canadian driver Lance Stroll there. And the American golfer Dustin Johnson has reclaimed the world number one ranking by winning the St. Jude Classic in Tennessee. Johnson now heads to the U.S. Open, which starts on Thursday night in New York. That's the news. No by-election blues. The last thing they would have wanted was a bloody nose. The three-strike law on the way out. I'd have some sense, you know, reading the tea leaves that Winston Peters will have a different view. Is North Korea in from the cold? My touch, my feel, that's what, that's what I do. Uh, how long will it take to figure out whether or not they're serious? I said, maybe in the first minute. Morning Report with Guy and Espiner and Susie Ferguson weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, New Zealand's healthy bee population masks serious threats from disease and parasites. Is the industry prepared? And after 10, with kickoff looming for the Football World Cup in Russia, we ask whether the sport's governing body, FIFA, has cleaned house. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. Now from MedService, the short forecast through to midnight tomorrow, Tuesday. As we mentioned in the news, a deep low moving over the North Island will bring heavy rain and strong winds to many areas over the next day or so. So Northland to Waikato, also Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Rain spreads south for the rest of today, some heavy falls. Uh, southerly winds, possibly severe gale in exposed places. Waitomo to Kapiti, including Taumaranui and Taihapi. Rain spreads south this evening or overnight tonight. Uh, heavy falls are possible tomorrow from Taranaki northwards. Southeasterlies, possibly severe gale in exposed places tomorrow. Gisborne to Wairarapa and for Wellington, periods of rain. Heavy falls in the east. Southeasterlies, possibly severe gale tomorrow. Marlborough and Canterbury, rain or drizzle. Rain becomes heavier tomorrow, especially in Marlborough. Nelson and Buller down to Fiordland. High cloud increasing, patchy rain north of Greymouth tomorrow. Otago and Southland becoming cloudy tomorrow, patchy drizzle in North Otago and the Otago Peninsula. And at the Chathams, mostly cloudy with a few showers tomorrow evening. It's eight and a half minutes past five. And you're with Checkpoint. I'm Rowan Quinn. In tonight for John Campbell. And first, in a humiliating about turn, the Justice Minister Andrew Little has dropped plans to repeal the street three strikes law after New Zealand first refused to give its support. Mr Little had been expected to bring the matter before Cabinet this morning, but instead called a media conference to say it was all off. Here's our political reporter Craig McCulloch. Andrew Little has long wanted to see the back of the three strikes law. It was one of the first pledges he made after becoming Justice Minister. And last month he signalled it would happen soon. This morning, a sudden back down. New Zealand First have said they are not prepared to support the repeal of three strikes at this point. They didn't want that to be seen as separate from a broader programme of criminal justice reform. So what happened? Did New Zealand First change its mind? Did Winston Peters renege on a deal? Or did Mr Little jump the gun before nailing down New Zealand First's support? I stand by my judgments. Before you get a paper to Cabinet, you go through a variety of hoops, and we had gone through all those hoops. Mr Peters is keeping his own counsel, turning down RNZ's interview request. 
the party's caucus meets tomorrow, after which it's understood the MPs will formally announce that they'll oppose any repeal of the three strikes law. But Mr Little says the disagreement doesn't show the coalition is dysfunctional. Look, this is coalition government. The parties have their ways of operating in the end. What's important is that you maintain the confidence of the parties. But the New Zealand First is very clear to me they are totally committed to criminal justice reform. This is clumsy, incompetent government that just doesn't know what it's doing. Nationals leader Simon Bridges says it's an embarrassing and amateur botch up. And, you know, if you can't trust the government to get this sort of basic stuff on law and order, on industry right, how can you trust them to run the country? Winston Peters, of course, is due to take over as Prime Minister pretty much any time now, when Jacinda Ardern goes to hospital to give birth. At her weekly press conference, the Prime Minister was in damage control mood keen to play down the significance of the day's events. All of these things are a matter of discussion for each of us as members of the government. As I say, three strikes makes up only a very small part of a much wider agenda, and we're continuing to pursue that agenda as a government. The day began with an open letter in the newspapers, victims of violent crimes, calling for the government to relent, not to push ahead with the repeal. One of them was Norm Withers, whose elderly mother was viciously beaten roughly two decades ago. He started a law and order petition that gained so many signatures, it forced a referendum in 1999. Quite frankly, I believe uh, Winston and the team have applied common sense. They've always had a pretty strong view on law and order going back, and I thought, well, if these guys turn around and support Mr Little, I would be deeply disappointed. On the flip side, Liam Martin from Victoria University is upset Labour backed down. And the criminology lecturer is worried about what it may portend for the wider reform. Three strikes has failed American prison policy, man. It's, it's a, a law named with a baseball slogan that doesn't even really make sense in New Zealand. So I just hope New Zealand First won't derail the whole reform agenda and criminal justice it has me worried about that. A wider criminal justice reform package is to be presented at a summit in August and expect another big announcement in this area this week. The government will reveal its plans for Waikaria Prison on Wednesday. But for now, it's hard not to see the three strikes back down as anything but deeply embarrassing for Andrew Little and the Prime Minister. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Craig McCulloch. The government's going to declare the damage caused by last week's flooding near Tolaga Bay a medium-scale adverse event, triggering more support for the region. The Gisborne District Council estimates it will cost at least $10 million to clean up the forestry debris strewn across roads and properties last week. Civil Defence is monitoring major rivers in the Gisborne area as more heavy rains due in the region still saturated from last week's weather. The Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, says she's seen photos of the damage in the area and says it's very significant, especially with more bad weather on the way. We uh, discussed it being declared um, a medium adverse event. I understand that now we have the request formally has come through um, from local, local council there. That enables us to expedite that and I've set out my expectation with the team that we move as quickly as we can. Uh, that will enable us to look at support through MSD, things like Task Force Green, because as I understand, particularly farmers need that assistance on the ground and we're looking for ways that we can provide that as quickly as possible. And the Met Service has issued a heavy rain warning for Gisborne tonight, which could cause streams and rivers to rise rapidly. It also warns surface flooding and slips are possible. A short time ago, I spoke with the Met Service meteorologist Georgina Griffiths and asked her what's in store for the region. We expect heavy rain and fairly significant rainfall accumulations in the next 24 hours or so. Now, a lot of that rain is around the ranges, of course, 150 to 220 millimetres of rain. But that comes on top of the Queen's birthday uh, rainfall and flooding. And the peak intensities are fairly up there at times. So we would expect some impacts. That's a fairly significant amount of rain in 24 hours, even for Gisborne. And what about the rest of the country? Yeah, I mean, this, this subtropical low is affecting, you know, wind-wise and some rain for much of the North Island, but we'll pick about pick the areas that we think are going to be severe. In fact, there are heavy rainfall warnings in force also for Hawke's Bay through from tonight, 8 o'clock or so, through till tomorrow night. Um, in those 24 hours, the accumulations are also likely to be significant, particularly around the ranges, 140 to 200 millimetres to accumulate there. Um, we also have a heavy rain warning in force for the Kaikoura Ranges, 
uh, up to 220 millimetres there, and that kicks in in the early hours of tomorrow through till 3 o'clock on Wednesday. So a fairly extended rainfall event for Kaikoura. Um, Wind-wise, you know, a lot of the country sees scales, um, particularly the lower north, lower North Island and the north of the South Island, but we are picking a few areas to see significant wind, severe gales, and this includes Bay of Plenty, including Rotorua. Those southeast scales um, increase uh, during tonight, and a forecast to become severe in exposed places from later this evening through until early Tuesday, with another period of northeast scales uh, around tomorrow afternoon. So it, you really have to be careful with those downslope winds in the Bay of Plenty. It can be quite localised, but quite significant. Also, Tolpul and Taihapi, with gusts um, in, in those places that are exposed to the southeasterly. Taranaki, uh, through basically tomorrow. Uh, also, Wanganui, Manawatu, and Kapiti, Horofanua. And those southeast scales haven't really kicked in yet. It's more tomorrow. Um, but they can be really damaging, and particularly the Kapiti through Taranaki area. So we have warnings in place uh, for Tuesday for those areas. Um, on the periphery, so Auckland southwards, and also... Um, the lower North Island for a watch is in place for some risk of wind and some rain, but um, the, the watch is just a monitoring eyeball at the moment, not likely to reach warning criteria, but it's going to be a significantly windy and somewhat wet period overnight and into tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty nasty. How, how does it compare to last week's one, especially for those people over on the east coast and, and around that Gisborne area? Well, it looks like the accumulations are comparable. The rainfall intensities are, at this stage, are forecast to be slightly lower, but I'm not sure that matters anymore. I mean, if you lived in Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, keep in touch with what the local hydrologists, your, your council people are saying, and, and or civil defence, of course, if they activate, because they know their rivers and they know what those rivers can cope with. And because we had that precursor event last week, the impacts, of course, you know, rivers come up quicker, everything's really saturated in those regions. And that is the Met Service meteorologist Georgina Griffiths there. Well, all eyes are on Singapore as anticipation mounts ahead of tomorrow's historic summit between the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and the US President Donald Trump. Both leaders are already in Singapore, staying in separate hotels on the eve of the first ever meeting between a North Korean leader and a sitting US President. They'll spend the day preparing for the summit, although Mr Trump's expected to meet with Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Xian Long. North Korean state media confirmed today that Kim Jong un will discuss a permanent and durable peacekeeping mechanism for the Korean Peninsula as well as denuclearization. But it's not clear what he might want in return. From Singapore, Laura Bicker reports. The waiting is over. The hard work starts now. Donald Trump is here to try to broker peace with one of America's long standing enemies after falling out with some of his closest allies. The US president left an extraordinary G7 meeting in Quebec in disarray over trade. And now to solve decades of division with North Korea, he's going with his gut instincts. I, I think within the first minute, I'll know. I just, my touch, my feel, that's what, that's what I do. The North Korean leader doesn't look like he's feeling his way, Considering this is his debut on the world's diplomatic stage, he looked calm and relaxed as he discussed his hopes for peace with the Singaporean Prime Minister. He's taking no chances with security. His hand-picked bodyguards have flown with him, along with his bulletproof limousine. Thousands took the chance to catch a rare glimpse of this usually reclusive leader. If Mr Kim is trying to transition from nuclear-armed dictator to global statesman, this summit's offering him the perfect platform. At this church in Singapore, South Koreans pray for the possibilities this may offer. And tears for the years of war both Koreas have endured. Yes. Some have criticised South Koreans for being overly optimistic about this meeting. But after a year of brinkmanship, most see the summit itself as progress. There's a Korean saying that the first spoonful of food will not make you full. 
I know the summit will be the first step towards much bigger changes. So even if the results aren't significant, I'll be thankful. While every detail is being dealt with on the island where they'll meet, no one's really sure whether they'll be in this secluded spot for two minutes, two hours, or even two days. The hopes of nearly 70 million Korean people lie here. It's their best chance of peace in decades, and it's fallen to an unpredictable US president and an untested North Korean leader. Perhaps the calm waters of this luxury resort will compel them to take tentative steps towards a deal. But rarely has there been a summit with higher stakes and greater uncertainty over its outcome. And that's the BBC's Laura Bicker in Singapore. In the US and Canada swung sharply towards a diplomatic and trade crisis as top White House advisers lashed out at Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in the wake of the G7 summit. White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow accused Mr. Trump of attacking Mr. Trudeau of attacking President Trump after he announced reciprocal tariffs on the US and asserted Canada would not be pushed around. Zachary Goldman from Reuters reports. President's barely out of there on the plane to North Korea and he starts insulting us. The White House on Sunday went on the attack against an unlikely enemy, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The spark that lit U.S. President Donald Trump's rage against Ottawa, Trudeau's announcement that Canada would impose tariffs of its own on the United States. We'll as Canadians, we're polite, we're reasonable, but we also will not be pushed around. Those words, too much for the Trump administration. Trudeau decided to attack the president. That's the key point. And yes, you know, if you attack this president, he's going to fight back. Aboard Air Force One on his way to a landmark meeting with the leader of North Korea, Trump unloaded on Trudeau for his remarks, calling him very dishonest and weak. And he went further by pulling his name from a joint communique signed by all the leaders of a G7 summit over the weekend, undercutting two days of top-level diplomatic efforts aimed at unity. I'm arguing Trudeau picked the fight. President Trump had no alternative, in my opinion. White House economic adviser Larry Kudlow on Sunday tried to explain the sudden fraying of one of the longest and most cherished international relationships in world history. Trudeau should have known better. Trump's decision in May to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum imports on several longtime allies, including Canada, shook up Ottawa, particularly because Trump cited national security as his justification. That it's kind of insulting. Trudeau has long tried to cultivate positive ties with Trump and the first family. But Trump's tariffs have tested the limits of that relationship, and the prime minister's public response may have been too much for the president to bear. My job is to stand up for Canadian workers, Canadian interests, and I will do that without flinching. The diplomatic trough sparking something of a social media boost for the Canadian leader. Twitter compared Trudeau's response to actor Hugh Grant's portrayal of a British prime minister who stands up to a lecherous and bullying American president in the 2003 film Love Actually. Reaction to but this drama may have real world consequences for the two nations. The fate of the North America Free Trade Agreement hangs in the balance and Trump has threatened to quit the deal if his terms are not met. That's Zachary Goldman from Reuters there. And the police commissioner says a couple made more than $4.5 million from a website which sold completed assignments to students. The commissioner, commissioner has taken Stephen Kwan Lee and his wife Fan Young to the High Court in Auckland, asking the court to order the money be forfeited under the Criminal Proceeds Recovery Act. Our reporter Edward Gay has been in court and he joins me now. Hi Edward, can you tell us how did this website operate? Yes, Rowan. Well, according to documents and computer hard drives seized by the police on a raid on the officers, um, students would either get in touch by email or they'd actually go physically to the office of assignments for you. That was actually situated just around the corner uh, from the studios here down on Cook Street. They'd supply the essay or assignment question and also sometimes supply even their university computer logon details. And that allowed assignments for you to then pass that information on to uh, its network of ghost writers who would research and write assignments. Uh, and uh, they'd sometimes use the students' login details uh, to contact the tutor directly, uh, presumably posing as the student. 
Uh, the assignment would then be completed by the ghostwriter using textbooks. Sometimes the student's own notes would be used. Uh, and then that assignment would then be passed back to assignments for you. Assignments for you would then uh, give it to the student, and the student would, um, according to the commissioner, pass that work off as their own. And we got an insight in court into how the company was charging for these. That's right. In some cases, there could be refunds um, that depended on the result, depended on the mark that they got back. Um, the the assignments for you aimed to get an A or a B for the students. Um, sometimes they would also guarantee a mark um, and there was a sliding scale of refunds if that mark wasn't achieved. But even in the case of a fail, a fail mark, um, the full price of that assignment was not refunded. Instead, they'd get a sort of in-store credit. Um, also, the pricing was revealed for bachelor degrees up to $185 per 1,000 words would be charged, um, and the prices were fi uh, weren't were fixed, sorry, and uh, frequent users were also given discounts. You keep coming back here, um, you, you, got, you got a better price. Uh, they'd, they'd normally, the assignments for you, the company would normally um, pass on 70% of um, the money they, they earned off a job to the ghostwriter. They'd keep 30% for the profit of the company. And assignments for you drew the line at exams, though. They 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 basically had a, um, a phone, um, model phone question and answer thing for their staff. And they told their staff that if they were asked by students if they could sit in on an exam for the student, um, assignments for you said no, they would not do that. Um, the commissioner says there were 492 jobs. They estimated um, that assignments for you charged out about $406 per job on average. And that calculation, uh, the lawyer for the commissioner, Mark Harbour, has said, is likely to be challenged by uh, Lee and Fanyan's lawyers. Uh, the allegation is that assignments for you was involved in fraud by enabling students to pass off this work as their own when it, it clearly wasn't their work. And they offered other services as well. That's right. David Jones QC, the lawyer for Stephen Kwan Lee and Fan Yang, pointed out that the company also provided proofreading, face-to-face uh, -face help with assignments. It also um, it also provided an online platform for secondhand um, 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 course books, uh, so people could buy and sell through um, through the company's website. Mr Jones actually questioned the officer in charge. He was up um, giving evidence today, uh, Detective Craig Smith, and uh, he was cross-examined by Mr Jones. Um, he, uh, Mr Jones took the detective to an early complainant in the case who claimed to have acted as a ghostwriter. Uh, he approached authorities, um, and Mr Jones pointed out that this complainant opened his letter to authorities, quote, I come in peace, end quote, and then went on to say, I am a peaceful inhabitor. Uh, and he made a number of allegations implicating a wide range of tertiary institutions. He then even signed the letter in red ink with a red fingerprint uh, next to his name. And Mr Jones asked Mr Smith if he had any concerns about the complainant's mental health. Uh, Mr Smith confirmed that the letter was sensationalised. He said that the writer was, uh, as he put it, having a rant. But Mr Smith said, uh, pointed to the complainant's concerns um, that were actually borne out when the police did a raid of the office and, and the Assignments for You office, and they actually found four assignments that this man had been or said he was involved in as a ghostwriter. They were actually on hard drives in the Assignments for You office. The case before Justice Wilford set down for four weeks. Thank you very much, Edward. That is our court reporter, Edward Gay. Well, the bad boy prince is coming back, but this time he's no longer a bachelor. Kensington Palace confirmed today that Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, are set to make their first official visit to New Zealand this October. And while nothing else has been confirmed, royalists throughout the country are already planning how they'll celebrate the arrival. Katie Doyle reports. The Duke and Duchess will touch down in New Zealand around the same time as the Invictus Games in Sydney. They'll also be travelling to Fiji and Tonga, but all further details are likely to be kept under wraps until closer to their arrival. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says she's thrilled the couple have chosen to include New Zealand in their first overseas tour. The Prince last visited in 2015 and it will be Ms Markle's second visit. This visit is still in the planning stages and we'll be providing further details regarding dates 
and itinerary closer um, to their arrival. Um, but certainly I'm sure there will be excitement around the country at the opportunity to show off um, all that New Zealand has to offer, um, both to the royal couple, um, but to what I'm sure will be a rather large entourage as well. And she's not the only one gearing up for the visit. Royalist Elizabeth Garlick says her love affair with the monarchy began with Princess Di. She's been collecting royal memorabilia for years and says one of her favourite pieces is a replica of the sapphire engagement ring given to the Duchess of Cambridge by Prince William. I wear that all the time and I've got a matching set of earrings that I um, created out of two pairs of earrings, created into drops and that's what I showed um, Harry when he came back in 2015 and he touched the ring and just said it was amazing and yeah, he really liked it. Ms Garlick says she's planning to take annual leave so she can follow the couple around the country when they arrive. I would have gone over to see him at the Invictus Games in Sydney anyway, so it's amazing that they're going to pop over to New Zealand and let us see them. Last time when Harry came, I made a sign and waited at the front of the crowd for a couple of hours, so I got a good um, chance to talk with him. Shirley Faber from Whangarei says she's been a royalist since the Second World War. She says she's ecstatic to see the royal couple in the flesh. We need some joy in our lives, really. And he is our prince, New Zealand's prince. And he's just been married to a beautiful girl. All those things are positive things. And he exudes positivity and caring. And that's why I'm excited. Elsewhere on the streets of Wellington, feelings about the upcoming visit were mixed. So it'll be a privilege to see them just with the crowds and everything. I guess um, probably not as excited as a lot of other people are, but sure, it'll be nice to see them here. Um, well, it doesn't really make a difference. Do you think you'll go out and see them when they come? No. Love them or not, the royal visit looks like it will have everyone talking. For Checkpoint, Katie Doyle. <laughs> You're with Checkpoint coming up. Principals tell Checkpoint they're outraged. Uh, outraged they've been included in a Ministry of Education list of schools who use seclusion. And a North Otago farmer counts the devastating cost of mycoplasma bovis. We love your feedback. Don't forget you can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, Facebook us, Checkpoint with John Campbell, or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. Right now, here's Paul Brennan with the headlines. Good evening. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is downplaying any disagreement within the government over criminal justice reform. The Justice Minister Andrew Little has been forced to back down from his plans to re repeal the three strikes law after failing to secure New Zealand First's support to do so. National says the about turn is an embarrassing display of the government's incompetence, but Ms Ardern rejects that. The government will declare damage caused by last week's heavy rain near Tolaga Bay on the east coast a medium-scale adverse event. The Gisborne District Council estimates it will cost at least $10 million to clean up the forestry debris strewn across roads and properties by flooding in the area. The Prime Minister says a request has been made to the government to declare a medium-scale adverse event and it will do so. Meanwhile, Met Service meteorologist Georgina Griffith says the region is expecting heavy rainfall again tonight, which could cause streams and rivers to rise rapidly, as well as possible surface flooding and slips. Donald Trump has continued his attacks on his G7 partners with a new round of tweets after withdrawing support from the closing communique of the G7 summit minutes after it was published. The US president has turned his fire on NATO. He's claimed the United States paid close to the entire cost of the defence organisation, protecting many countries, which in his words, rips off the US on trade. And Stewart Island is one step closer to establishing an approved dark sky sanctuary. The Stewart Island Raki Ura Community Board has unanimously agreed to ask the Southland District Council to investigate an official bid to become a sanctuary. The board will ask the council to consider new bylaws or changing district plans to meet international dark sky association standards. The board chairman, John Spraggan, says the application could be submitted in July. Those are the headlines. Our next news and sport update will be at six. And we've got business news now 
now with Nona Peltier here in the studio. Hi Nona, the Hello. country's biggest poultry producer Teagles uh, said it's had a drop in profit and it's had flat sales and it's about to be um, change ownership. So yeah. what, what's the story there? A lot of drama for Teagle. They've yeah. had a challenging year to say the least. So their profit, their net profit uh, fell what about 25 percent and uh, yeah they they made $26.1 million, so that's still a profit, but uh, was down uh, substantially $10 million of one-time costs associated with um, the ex-cyclone uh, Gita, mm -hmm. damaged uh, some of their uh, infrastructure, so that hit them, and then they had some restructuring costs. And on top of that, a uh, Philippine-based uh, poultry producer made a takeover offer for the company and have managed to secure about 62% of mm -hmm. the shares. So that's promise, sort of, so to speak. And they, they have bought some on the market as well. At this stage, it does look like the company is going to fall into a foreign ownership. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But meanwhile, the company is still trading on the market. And uh, so the Philippines-based Bounty Holdings offered $1.23 a share for the company. And uh, well, one of the largest shareholders uh, in the company said, yeah, we'll take it. And now the independent directors have come out and said, yeah, you know, it's a good deal for shareholders recommending that they accept it. So you would expect that to go ahead at some point. So yeah, that's what we're looking at with Teagle. Yeah, and Air New Zealand, um, a fair increase today, which we're always interested in, um, on, on international travel. I think they put up domestic fares yes, last week. Yes, yes. Well, that wasn't uh, totally unexpected. So overall, the average increase on international fares is going up 3%. Some is going to go more, some are less, depending on the most competitive routes. And just before the uh, we started talking, there we do know that there is a lot of competition on some particular routes, for example, into China or even into the United States. There there are, uh, you know, Air New Zealand does have competitors there. So one of the ways that they've addressed that is by introducing surcharges on weekend travel and so forth. Now those things can come on and off. So yes, and these fares are going to start coming into effect from this week, June 13th. Now they were signaled earlier this month when uh, the airlines, uh, I guess about 200 of them met in Sydney, talk about issues and the things that they were talking about were like fuel costs. Uh, that's an issue for them and, and other kinds of costs. Airport charges, you know, that's one of the things that has been a, a real issue here in New Zealand. People complaining about the Auckland Airport's fees. They're raising um, fees, I think it adds, it's not a lot, like it sounds like not a lot, mm. like 16 cents per passenger. Um, you'd think, well, that's what's yeah. that. But, but it adds up, and uh, they need the money to build a new, um, a second air uh, runway. For example, Auckland Airport only has one, and now they're going to build a second one. They're going to, all that is going to cost something like, um, well, several billion dollars. Mm. And so, yeah, all these costs do start to um, add up for the airline. And uh, the airline, so the airport and the airlines don't want to pay for it. They're saying, hey, make your shareholders pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> or the passengers. Or the passengers. <laughs> yeah. Well, not us, though. We don't want to pay for it. So those costs are just passed right on to customers, and that's what mm. we're seeing here. And what's happened on the markets today? Well, you know, we had another record close today, so uh, we up about a quarter of a percent, which is significant because mm. the markets are unsettled, as you would be not surprised given what happened over the weekend with the G7 meeting in Quebec. Uh, with uh, Donald Trump leaving early and uh, basically saying, uh, you know, trade war, well, trade is definitely an issue and the markets were unsettled by that. No one knows exactly what's going to happen. And then he's got a meeting uh, with his, uh, in North Korea, the North Korean meeting in Singapore. Some people are speculating whether that's going to amount to anything. So there's a lot of uncertainty in Asia. But for us, those markets keep going up, don't they, in New Zealand? Yeah, so, uh, you know, so the Asian markets were a little bit uh, weak when they opened up. They're, they've recovered a bit. But ours, you know, it was I was looking at it late this afternoon. It looked a little bit less, you know, a little changed. But it finished on a strong note, up a quarter of a percent to, that's 21 points up to 8,960. So we're knocking on 9,000 as a uh, index mm. high. That's close, and that would be substantial. Now, sometimes, you know, when you look at, prices at these levels, some of our blue chip companies are looking quite expensive. And so we're starting to see some indications from analysts indicating that this might be a time to take some profits. But we're not seeing that yet, so that remains to be seen. On our dollar, mm -hmm. interestingly, where uh, we gained a little bit again in late trading, 70.4 US cents. 
92.5 Australian and 52.5 pence. Thank you very much. That's Nona Peltier with business there. Well, as the full extent of the mycoplasma bovis outbreak becomes clearer, farmers are nervously watching and waiting to see if their herds will be the next to be culled. But for some, like North Otago farmer Susan McEwen, the damage has already been done. She lost 600 of the 3,000 calves she was trying to fatten back in mid-2016, a full year before M. bovis had been uncovered. Farming runs deep in Susan's veins and she takes pride in her skills and knowledge when it comes to rearing animals. So to find out many of them were dropping dead from pneumonia or suffering arthritis was a complete shock and a mystery she just couldn't crack. It was only after seeing Checkpoint Story in May on the condition of M. bovis infected calves coming out of Alphonse Z. Stratton's farm that she finally made the connection with what she'd experienced with her animals. Like Winton farmer Z. Wallings, she'd taken calves from the Z. Stratton's and like the Wallings, her calves had suffered badly, either failing to put on weight or having to be put down. Susan's now lost her farm in large part, she says, to the $100,000 she lost in 20 2016 due to failing to fulfil a contract that required her to get the calves to a certain weight. As far as MPI is concerned, the farm remains M. bovis free, but Susan is confident the problems she had back in 2016 were due to the disease. Her only work now is cleaning jobs around Palmerston, a big fall for someone who used to run the biggest calf rearing operation in the South Island. Conan Young and video journalist Richard Tindler travelled to Palmerston to hear her story. So this is everything? My life. After losing her farm and the house she'd called home for five years, Susan was forced to pack most of her belongings inside a container. The financial losses she experienced in 2016 contributed to her marriage breaking up and last year the farm had to be sold. She was kept on by the new owners as the farm manager but two months ago, she was let go. Susan's now making ends meet by taking cleaning jobs around Palmerston. Um, pretty big fall from grace, really, if we're honest, from managing and owning three and a half thousand calf rearing operation to cleaning houses, living with my partner, and any job I can get. Susan shows me the farm she poured her heart and soul into all those years working 17 hours a day rearing calves. So it goes right up to the pine trees on the left hand side corner and originally we went behind the pine trees and up to that rise then it goes up to the water tanks you can see on the ridge towards that house through the trees and then it cuts through up to the road up here. Losing all of this has been a bitter pill to swallow. I um, really struggled to leave here. I bred um, competition ponies for 25 years and I put my stallion to sleep here a month before they told me they didn't need me. She knew straight away something was not right with the calves she was receiving in 2016, which suffered pneumonia and arthritis, and simply didn't respond to the drugs she'd always had success with in the past. It was destroying. It was soul destroying, mentally destroying. It was the worst experience ever. Um, pulling 20, 30 calves out of sheds that just shouldn't die doesn't make sense. As somebody from a prominent farming family with an honours degree in agriculture, a master's in animal health and a lifetime of experience working with calves, she was stumped, as was her vet and MPI. These calves were blood tested, autopsy after autopsy after autopsy, no bugs, there was nothing showing up. In the end, um, some calves were showing high copper levels and that just, at the time, I suppose it provided some sort of answer, but it didn't because I've used the same system year after year. The milk powder is a product imported. I know the product. I've had good results with it. Nothing added up. She didn't know it at the time, but about 250 of the calves were from a farm belonging to Alphonse Stratton and were sent to her at a time when the farm is known to have been infected with M. bovis. 
It wasn't until a month ago when she saw Checkpoint's story about the calves sent from Z Stratons to the farm owned by Sarah Flintoft and Ben Walling that she joined the dots and realised M Bovis may have been to blame for her situation as well. I instantly got on the phone to my 2IC, who has worked for me for the last five years, and I sent her the video, and it was just like, wow, we've seen all this. But we saw it 12 months earlier. The following day, she got on the phone to MPI to tell them she'd farmed calves from an infected property. She still hasn't heard back from them and continues to worry about how far the potentially infected calves from her farm may have been sent when they left her in 2016. Um, because of the size of my operation and because the calves were all contract reared and owned by Grays Care, I believe calves in 2016 have pretty much gone from Kaitaia to Bluff. I think they're all Frisian bulls, they're all black and white bulls. A lot of these calves will now have been used as service bulls. And I believe the, car, the bulls that are still alive will still be all around the country. Very few of them will have been killed yet. We're still only, um, they're only 18 to 20 months old. So some will have been killed, some will have reached killer bull weights, but a huge majority of them will still be in the country. A Grays Care spokesperson admitted some of the calves sent to Susan's farm in 2016 had come from the infected farm of Valfonsi Stratton but they said the ones that left her place that year were all sent to slaughter and none of them were used as service bulls. All records from that year have been supplied by Grays Care to MPI. Susan says the whole experience left her doubting herself and her abilities when it came to rearing calves. I, I know I'm from a good family and a good farming family and this mycoplasma thing, it's, if this is what's affected my calves and my life, it just destroys me. Unlike those found to have infected farms, Susan is unlikely to receive any compensation from MPI. In Palmerston for Checkpoint, call Conan Young Tene. And you can hear more on Conan's insight investigation into mycoplasma bobus this Sunday morning after the 8 o'clock news. The Kapiti District Council will consider putting up some money to get local flights off the ground again. Air New Zealand stopped its daily flight between Paraparaumu and Auckland in early April, upsetting the local community and politicians. Since then, Air Chathams has been in negotiations to take over the route. Laura Dooney explains. People living on the Kapiti coast, north of Wellington, want to see the flights resume and back the council putting its hand in its pocket to help make that happen. It depends to what extent. Obviously not uh, a huge amount of money, but, but to get it established, if it's not economically viable, it shouldn't go ahead anyway. Capital does need a, a service link to uh, Auckland because there is an elderly population here. They tend to do a lot of travelling. My husband has to fly to Auckland quite often and it means a two-hour trip into Wellington. Finding parking, you know, it's just ridiculous having to go that far. The council should be doing something about this and really getting fully behind it and getting things moving. Well, I think it's a no-brainer, really. So many people here that either retired or from Auckland and go backwards and forwards, or I for one do as well. My family um, lives in Auckland and we, we quite like driving because we've got a holiday home in Turangi. And, um, but flying is so much more convenient and not having that service is a um, bit of a bummer, really. On Thursday, the Kapiti Coast District Council will consider a report outlining how it might support the proposed service. The details are secret due to commercial sensitivity and the council can't say how much it would spend. Mayor K. Gurunathan says they've put in an application for funding from the government's Regional Development Fund, but in the meantime it's in the region's interests for the council to step up. I know that this airport, from study that we've done, there is an outflow of what, more than $3 million of benefit to the local economy, as it is now, or with Air New Zealand operating. K. Gurunathan says negotiations have now reached a point where the council and the government can consider helping get the flights reinstated. So while our negotiations with the government in terms of any um, support that we can get to reduce the cost for HHM to make it sustainable is ongoing, it's slow. Council may need to step up to fill in the gap in, and until such time as the negotiations of the government uh, fulfills uh, the desired outcome that we want out of that. As the negotiations continue, 
The absence of Parapara Umu to Auckland flights is starting to hurt local businesses. Kapiti Coast Chamber of Commerce Chair Heather Hutchings says the uncertainty is causing frustration. It's just the not knowing. It's being unsure about is it going to be next month, is it going to be August, is it going to be September. It just seems to be ongoing and the longer that it's left, of course, the more unsure businesses and people in the community become. Ms Hutchings says if the route isn't picked up by Air Chathams, the impact could be devastating. Right now, Kapiti is a thriving community, but if that airline disappears on us, I you know, I really can't say what the consequences would be, other than, than there would be huge disappointment. And I think you would find that the community would not allow that. Heather Hutchings says the Chamber and local businesses are confident flights will begin again eventually. Air Chatham's General Manager Dwayne Emery says the airline is feeling a lot more positive about getting the route going, knowing the council is interested in assisting financially. He says the service costs to fly in and out of the airport are higher than others, which makes it difficult for the small airline. For Checkpoint, call Laura Duniaho. Two years ago, the Ministry of Education discovered, along with New Zealand, that some schools were placing children, many with disabilities, in seclusion rooms against their will. The Ministry immediately directed schools to stop the practice, and a law change banning the rooms passed several months later. At the time, the Ministry named 17 schools that used seclusion in 2016, but refused to name the other 19 schools that initially self-reported as using seclusion facilities prior to that. Michelle Cook has obtained the names of the schools on that list and some have told her they've never used seclusion and they're outraged they're on it. Victoria Turnbull is a mum on a mission. After discovering her autistic son had been placed in seclusion at Ruru Specialist School on several occasions between 2011 and 2014, she went on a crusade for answers. But not just answers for herself. She wanted answers for all parents in New Zealand. How many children were placed in rooms against their will? How many parents, just like her, had no idea? What were the names of the other schools that reported using seclusion? The Ministry refused her request to name the schools because it didn't want to, quote, name and shame the schools that did not undertake the use of seclusion in 2016. Parents need to be informed. It shouldn't be something that's covered up, you know, for the sake of... Um, you know, not naming and shaming schools. They need to ask if it happened to their child and then they need to find out why they weren't told about it. She complained to the Ombudsman and he recently ruled the Ministry should have named the schools. So more than a year after her initial request, the Ministry gave her the names. The 19 schools are scattered throughout the country from Auckland to Invercargill. The Ministry says these are the schools that self-reported as having seclusion facilities, but upon further investigation, 12 were found to have used appropriate timeout behaviour management practices. The Ministry refused to tell us the names of the other seven schools. It says its survey of 2,529 schools at the end of 2016 was to find out what schools were currently using seclusion and it had not tried to identify what schools used seclusion in the years before that. Former Green MP Catherine Delahunty says that's not good enough I asked her whether she thinks schools that use seclusion before 2016 should be identified and named. Yes, I do, because children who have experienced seclusion uh, have suffered trauma and the parents or the whanau may not even know. So I think that the the, um, honourable thing to do with this issue is for people to have the knowledge. I know schools are worried about being... um, regarded as uh, abusive or failing children. Many of them have done that because they didn't know, or many of the ones who um, may have done this in the past, and we still don't know (laughs) if they have, maybe because they um, have not known what else to do. But we can't deal with this issue by putting it under the carpet. Uh, it's it's like any other form of trauma. The children uh, and the families, need it needs to be open and they need to know about it. Checkpoint has contacted all 19 schools on the list. Kota Inui School in Lower Hutt refused to comment. Palmerston North Adventist Christian School did not respond to several requests. Allen Vale Special Schools acting principal referred me to board chair Graham Wood who told me the school had decided to decline my request for an interview. He did, however, say the school had used a seclusion area, 
but he didn't know the history of it, other than that it was used very minimally and with the permission of caregivers and parents. When asked if students were ever locked in the room, he said, quote, not to my knowledge. A parent whose child previously attended the school said she knew about the area, but assumed it was used only very occasionally and as a last resort if students were very violent. She said if her daughter had been put in there, she would have, quote, hit the roof. We went to ask other parents if they knew of the area the board chair referred to. Again, parents about Allenvale's use of a seclusion room prior to 2016. Did you know about that? No, no I didn't, sorry. Does that surprise you? Yeah, I don't. I've only been here for not long, sorry. Principals from the other 16 schools told me they categorically did not use seclusion in the past, nor had seclusion rooms. Some said they might have appeared on the list as the ministry's process was seriously flawed. Langholm School Principal Martin Weatherill was among many who said there was a lack of clarity of what the ministry meant by seclusion. The ministry, when they first started ringing schools, couldn't define what a seclusion room was. In other words, they couldn't tell us what it was they were asking us, do we have one of? They were asking a yes-no question, and they couldn't actually tell us what it was they were asking about. Mr Weatherill says his school has never secluded students, nor had a seclusion room. Because we didn't categorically say no, what we said was, well, because you can't actually tell us what one is, we can't actually tell you the answer to your question. Could you please find out and come back to us? I think that's why my name of my school is on your list. The Ministry has now clearly defined seclusion as when a student is placed in a room involuntarily, alone, and from which they cannot freely exit or believe they cannot freely exit. But as schools were asked to self-identify, the Ministry has said in the past there's a risk there are more that use seclusion. Victoria Turnbull is certain there are. I've been contacted by um, a couple of parents, or, or a number of parents actually, who, um, who suggest that, um, who suggest that uh, the schools that their children were attending put their child in, in seclusion rooms, so in, into a room that the child could not freely exit, and um, they were put in there by force. And were those schools on the list of um, schools that self-reported that you were uh, provided? Uh, the parents that contacted me know the, the, the schools that their um, children were attending, um, their, na- their names aren't on the list that the Ministry has provided. No one from the Ministry was available for an interview, but in a statement it said it worked intensively with the 17 schools identified as using seclusion in 2016. It supported them to develop alternative practices for managing challenging behaviour. Sixteen of the schools have undertaken the Ministry's Understanding Behaviour, Responding Safely de-escalation training programme and one has had tailored behaviour training focused on meeting the needs of an individual student. But Catherine Delahunty says there needs to be better support and training for all schools. We need to own that seclusion rooms was a consequence of the lack of understanding of um, neurodiverse and high needs kids um, and the lack of professional support in schools. The Ministry is currently investigating one case of seclusion that predates the law change. For Checkpoint, Michelle Cook. And to Guatemala now, where Euphemia Garcia watched in horror as the Fuego volcano sent scalding ash and gas surging over her home a week ago, burying her children and grandson and 50 of her extended family. And as Reuters' Nathan Frandino reports, she's been searching for their remains ever since. In San Miguel Los Lotes, Guatemala, Eufemia Garcia is looking for her family. All 50 of them who are lost and presumably dead, buried by the Fuego volcano. It's now a recovery mission and hope is running short. She doubts any of her family, including her children and grandson, survived. They are buried. I've looked here in the morgue and in another morgue, but there is no sign of them. The Fuego volcano killed at least 110 people since erupting last Sunday and covered villages like this one in ash and rubble. With almost no family left, Garcia does not know what she will do next. But for now, she says, all that matters is the search and a proper burial. Even if it's just a few little bones, even if it's just a piece of cloth, I will give them a Christian burial and I will know where their final resting place is. 
desaparecidos. A chance for closure amid death and destruction. And you are with Checkpoint. Coming up after six tonight, the repeal of the controversial three strikes law. It's been struck out by New Zealand First. We'll hear from the Justice Minister Andrew Little about that back down. The Gisborne area is bracing for more heavy rain just a week after flash flooding sent all sorts of logs through the Tolaga Bay area, wiping away stock and damaging property. We speak to our, chorus, uh, we speak to our correspondent Anna Fifield in Singapore ahead of tomorrow's summit. Please get in touch with us with your feedback. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, Facebook us at Checkpoint with John Campbell, or you can email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz and of course you can Check out all Radio New Zealand's news on our website, uh, rnz.co.nz. RNZ News at 6. Good evening, I'm Paul Brennan. The Christchurch Victims' Rights Advocate Norm Withers is congratulating New Zealand First for spiking the repeal of the Three Strikes Law. The Justice Minister, Andrew Little, has been forced to back down over his plans to repeal the contentious law after failing to secure New Zealand First's support to do so. Mr Withers started a law and order petition roughly two decades ago after his elderly mother was viciously beaten. He says he's pleased that three strikes will stay. Quite frankly, I believe uh, Winston and the team have applied common sense. They've always had a pretty strong view on law and order going back. And I thought, well, if these guys turn around and support Mr Little, I would be deeply disappointed. That's the victim rights advocate Norm Withers. Damage caused by last week's heavy rain near Tolaga Bay will be declared a medium-scale adverse event by the government. The Gisborne District Council estimates it will cost at least $10 million to clean up the forestry debris strewn across roads and properties by flooding in the area. Civil Defence is monitoring major rivers in the Gisborne area as more heavy rain is due in the region, still saturated by last week's flooding. The Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, says a request has been made to the government to declare a medium-scale adverse event, and it will do so. That will enable us to look at support through MSD, things like Task Force Green, because as I understand, particularly farmers need that assistance on the ground, and we're looking for ways that we can provide that as quickly as possible. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Meanwhile, Med Service says most of the North Island will be battered with heavy rain, wind and or both overnight. Rain warnings are in place for Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Kaikoura. A wind warning is also in place for Bay of Plenty, Taranaki, Manawatu, Whanganui, Taupo and Kapiti. Meteorologist Georgina Griffiths told Checkpoint Bay of Plenty in particular could be in for severe winds. Those southeast scales um, increase during tonight and a forecast to become severe in exposed places from later this evening through until early Tuesday. So you really have to be careful with those downslope winds in the Bay of Plenty. It can be quite localised but quite significant. Georgina Griffiths from Met Service. The rain is expected to disrupt travel on State Highway 1 between Christchurch and Picton. Rain is forecast across Kaikoura Coast from early tomorrow morning through to Wednesday. The transport agency says it's likely the road will be closed overnight on Tuesday due to the increased likelihood of rockfall. The road ex is expected to reopen on Wednesday following inspections. North Korean state media has confirmed that the country's leader, Kim Jong-un, will discuss a permanent peacekeeping mechanism when he meets with the U.S. President Donald Trump tomorrow. Both leaders have spent the day in Singapore preparing for tomorrow's historic meeting. The ABC's Jake Sturmer reports from Seoul. The United States thinks the North Koreans should remove nukes from the entire peninsula, but the North Koreans think the US should remove their nuclear umbrella over this peninsula. They are some of the discussions that are going to be going on uh, behind the scenes and, and probably in the lead-up and ultimately in the meeting between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. Of course, there's also the option of a peace treaty. There are 28,000 US soldiers here in South Korea if there were to be a peace treaty, North Korea would probably want a significant proportion of them to leave. Jake Sturmer reporting there. A lifeline could be on the way for a cancelled air service between Paraparaumu and Auckland. Early in April, Air New Zealand stopped flying between the two centres. On Thursday, the Kapiti Coast District Council will consider subsidising Air Chatham so it can get the service operating again. The Mayor, Kay Guranathan, says the council will look at reducing costs for the airline. 
in the first few months, uh, maybe six or even up to a year, they will be testing the market. And therefore, it's a question of what loading they can get to make it profitable and how long it takes them to get to that stage. There's some element of underwriting to that to help them achieve that. Kay Gurunathan says any such funding would need to be approved by the council first. Today is the last day the Prime Minister will spend in Wellington as she prepares for the birth of her child. Jacinda Ardern has just given her last post-Cabinet news briefing before taking six weeks off for parental leave. Once she arrives at the hospital, the New Zealand First Leader and Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters will take over as Acting Prime Minister for the time she's away. With a due date of June the 17th, Ms Ardern says it's time to stay a bit closer to home. After today, I will continue to work, but I will be basing myself in Auckland for the remainder of the week. The suggestion has been that my consistent travel may be tempting fate to a certain degree, so I will be travelling within vehicular distance from uh, Auckland for the remainder um, of this week. Jacinda Ardern speaking there at her post-Cabinet news briefing. It's five minutes past six. On to sport now, the All Blacks loose forward Luke Whitelock says the team must improve its tackle technique as a crackdown on any contact with the ball carrier's head continues. Concern around concussion has seen World Rugby adopt stricter tackling policy with the tackle from Saturday's test in Auckland which left French wing Remy Grosso with facial fractures, the latest incident to create debate. All Blacks flanker Sam Kane was penalised but not carded for catching a falling grosso across the face and Whitelock says there is little room for error when lining up a tackle. Yeah, I guess it's uh, pretty evident the way that things are being refed, if you get that part wrong, you can see yourself sort of sitting on the sidelines. So I guess it's something we've got to train and get better at as individuals and getting our techniques right. And obviously when you say that the target changes, we sort of got to probably change the way we try and make that tackle. Luke Whitelock. Meanwhile, former Australian Super Rugby team, the Western Force, have welcomed former All, uh, All Black Lock Jeremy Thrush into their squad. Thrush, who joined English side Gloucester after the 2015 World Cup, will play four games for the Force in the new World Series rugby competition. And the Southern Steel can get in, can get to within a point of national netball competition leaders, the Central Pulse, when they play the mainland tactics in Christchurch tonight. The Pulse lost their first game of the season last night when they were beaten by the Northern Mystics. The Steel have lost just two of their seven games this season, while the Tactics are third despite having won just three games. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Ali Cook wants to let the cat out of the bag. That cat being country music and its hidden treasures. Dana Johansson talks sport, which could include the test at Eden Park, given she lives next door. And we have a window on the world of the biggest bread research project since they started slicing the stuff. And for an eclectic mix of music, news, interviews and anything else we can squeeze into the hour, join me for Lately. After the extended news bulletin at 10, I'll be talking current affairs, foreign affairs, politics, music and the arts. For an eye on the world, Lately with Karen Hay, 10 to 11, weeknights on RNZ National. Thank you, Karen. Now the short forecast taking us through to midnight tomorrow from Med Service. That deep low is moving over the North Island tomorrow, bringing heavy rain and strong winds to many areas. Northland to Waikato, also Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty and Topol. Rain spreading south for the rest of today, some heavy falls, southerly winds, possibly severe gale in exposed places. Waitomo to Kapiti, that includes Taumanunui and Taihapi. Rain spreads south this evening or overnight tonight. Heavy falls are possible tomorrow from Taranaki northwards. Southeasterlies, possibly severe gale in exposed places tomorrow. Gisborne to Wairarapa and Wellington, periods of rain, heavy falls in the east, southeasterlies, possibly severe gale tomorrow. Marlborough and Canterbury, rain or drizzle becoming heavier tomorrow, especially in Marlborough. Nelson and Buller through to Fiordland, cloud increasing, patchy rain north of Greymouth tomorrow. Otago and Southland becoming cloudy tomorrow, patchy drizzle in North Otago and the Otago Peninsula. At the Chathams, mostly cloudy with a few showers tomorrow evening. It is eight minutes past six. Thanks Paul and you're with Checkpoint. I'm Rowan Quinn in tonight for John Campbell. Well, the repeal of the controversial three strikes law has been struck out by New Zealand First. In an embarrassing back down, the Justice Minister Andrew Littles has, has dropped plans to repeal the 2010 law after New Zealand First refused to give its support. Mr Little has been expected to bring the matter before Cabinet this morning but instead called a media conference to say it was all off. 
New Zealand First have said they are not prepared to support the repeal of three strikes at this point. They didn't want uh, that to be seen as separate from a broader programme of criminal justice reform. But they are very clear with me. They are totally committed to criminal justice reform. What consultation did you do with New Zealand First before you embarked on this? Well, nothing gets before Cabinet without having gone through a variety of hoops beforehand. But the reason why you have a variety of hoops is that people take time to pause and reflect, and, uh, and that happens. We've got to the point now where they would prefer, rather than piecemeal proposals going to Cabinet, they want to see a full, well-rounded balanced package, and that's what we do. So there was a change in position this morning. a hugely dysfunctional government, you cannot get some of your flagship reforms across the line. Um, no, you're wrong in two respects. First of all, the flagship reforms are, are, are happening um, in a lot of areas, and criminal justice reform... They might criminal, I'll, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. Criminal justice reform is happening. There will be a package of criminal justice reform coming out of this government. Secondly, this is coalition government. This is when you have a genuine coalition government of a variety of parties with a, a span of views, you, you take on board all those views and that's what we're doing. But the government is very clear, all parties in government, is we have to reform our criminal justice system if we want safer communities and fewer victims of crime. And that's what we're committed to do. Blocks. They're beginning to fall over straight out of the blocks. I disagree with you. Have the they changed their minds? Uh, well, that's a matter you're going to have to talk to New Zealand First about, but I am very clear in my discussions with New Zealand First is that they are totally committed to criminal justice reform. They are not prepared to accept the burgeoning prison population and the reoffending rate that we have, 60%, um, within two years of release of prison, higher for younger offenders. That means more victims of crime. Unless we're prepared to do something about that, then we're failing all citizens of New Zealand who are potential victims of crime, and we're failing our criminal justice system. So we have to change. Um, let, let me go right back to the beginning. We have a criminal justice reform program. We are doing criminal justice reform. This government is totally committed to reforming our criminal justice system. And so this government is totally committed to criminal justice reform. That's what we're doing. That's why we have a criminal justice summit. That's why we're having an advisory group uh, that will assist in putting a package together. And as it was always intended, the, the meat of the reform will happen next year when we look at a whole variety of, of aspects of it. Did you not have announced first change of mind, or did you wrongly assume that you had a support? Or did they renege? No, I stand by all the judgments that I've made, but in the discussions, certainly last week, I got to the point on Friday where I discussed with the Prime Minister, look, we're better just to take this off the table now, rather than have a piecemeal approach to this reform, let's have the full package uh, of, of all elements of it that we know are about doing better for those in prison, reducing our re-offending rate, therefore reducing our offending rate, therefore having fewer victims of crime. So that's what we're focused on and that's what we're doing. That's the Justice Minister Andrew Little talking to reporters there. And it seems New Zealand First isn't keen to talk about the matter. The party's leader, Winston Peters, Cabinet Minister Shane Jones and Social Services spokesperson Derek Ball all declined Checkpoint's interview requests. Well, the Gisborne area is bracing for more heavy rain just a week after flash flooding hit Tolaga Bay. The Met Service has issued a heavy rain warning for Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and the Kaikoura Ranges. A week ago, Tolaga Bay, north of Gisborne, was hit with 200 millimetres of rain in 24 hours, causing serious flooding, a wave of forestry debris and evacuations. The government today said that the damage will be declared a medium-scale adverse event, triggering additional support for the region. Well, our reporter Anusha Bradley's in Gisborne and joins us now via live view. Gosh, Anusha, it looks pretty wet there already. What's expected to happen from here on in? Oh, I have to say, Rowan, it is pretty wet and miserable here right now, and I'm feeling pretty cold. Look, the forecast is for up to 220 millimetres of rain in the next 24 hours. To put that into context, there was 260 millimetres of rain in uh, Gisborne just last week, last Monday, and that, that led to that flash flooding in Tolaga Bay area. So you can see why the council is so worried, so concerned about the rain tonight, because the ground is already so soaked. Flying into Gisborne this afternoon, you can see just how sodden the ground is. There's flash flooding, and oh, sorry, there was uh, um, surface flooding you could see from the air and some roads uh, on some roads and fields. 
But it's in Gisborne City itself where the main problem really is expected to hit tonight. Um, so the council has issued a warning. You can see here behind me there's some sandbags on that the council's dropped here outside these shops. This area has flooded before just because the storm system here, the wastewater system just can't cope when there is heavy rain. So there will be some um, tense moments, some uh, worried citizens here tonight in Gisborne. Yeah, it sounds like the authorities are, are really ramping up. Have you got any sense about how worried they are about what could happen? Yeah, so they are keeping a watch on all the major rivers. They are thinking about maybe evacuating some uh, residents from high-risk areas that maybe flooded last time as a precaution, but they haven't made a decision on that just yet. Thanks very much for uh, joining us tonight there from a windy and wet-looking Gisborne. That's our reporter, Anusha Bradley. And Mika Faitiri is the MP for Ikaroa Rafati, which runs the length of the east coast of the North Island. She's also the Associate Forestry Ministry, a Minister, and she visited Tolaga Bay last week after those flash floods that we've just been talking about. Our producer, Bridget Burke, spoke to her a short time ago and asked her about the impact of more rain. We're going to get uh, hit with heavy rainfalls in short uh, amount of time, uh, which is what caused the uh, massive uh, Queen's birthday floods last week. So um, it's unfortunate it's come so close to the first one, um, but people, I believe, uh, back home there are prepared, and hopefully those that are on low ground have moved. People are weary uh, that another downpour as severe as the first one will, will lead to potentially more slips and more, and more debris moving about the place. So um, it won't stop it happening, but I guess in some small part being prepared that it, it will unlikely uh, lead to more damage um, is unfortunate. Um, over the next 24 hours is going to be really critical. Uh, but everybody's on alert and on standby. Minister Shane Jones briefing Cabinet this afternoon about the incident there. Then out of Cabinet came the decision to declare what happened last weekend a, a medium adverse event. What does that mean for your people in Ikaroa Rafati and that region? Well, as, as you've reported, Shane has taken that to Cabinet and the Prime Minister post-Cabinet has indicated uh, that, uh, that that would be the result uh, once all the final information has received. Uh, the medium-scale event triggers, uh, obviously, a round of support or uh, a measure, a range of support that will come from, from central government, uh, including, obviously, uh, financial as well as, uh, as, well as people uh, power. Um, I've spoken to uh, one of the ministers that's been named on the working group from the Prime Minister, Minister O'Connor, uh, that we're looking at even uh, unlocking uh, military power to help with the clean-up. Um, so financial support in terms of regional assistance payments, uh, technical advice around industry bodies, um, the enhanced task force screen, that MSD, uh, income equalisation from uh, from inland revenue, so a range of government, like I said, government services will be enacted uh, once we can um, get up there and, and and get cracking. So this will give some assurances uh, to the affected communities in the Tolaga Bay uh, region. Minister, will you be getting a briefing first thing in the morning from from GDC, the Gisborne District Council, or their civil defence team? Yes, I've been in, in daily contact uh, both with um, GDC as well as uh, feed farmers, uh, as well as the industry, uh, forestry industry people. Concerns for ongoing stock losses there on some of the farms? Yes, stock losses, uh, fences that have fallen over. Uh, we've got heavily pregnant cows. Uh, and then, of course, winter feed, because we're in the middle of winter, uh, is non-existent because a lot of the flat land is covered in silt. So... Mm. I'm also mindful of the fatigue uh, demonstrated by many of the farmers. If you know the farmers up our coast, they're a resilient bunch, uh, that when you go up and ask them uh, if they're OK, they'll generally send you to the next farmer saying that they're much worse than I. So um, as a local MP, I'm conscious that uh, farmers, it's been almost a week since the first flood, um, moving stock and trying to find feed, uh, in the difficult circumstances means that we've got to be mindful that their supporters, uh, we, need their, we need to support the farmers on the ground 
uh, which is why we're doing what we can back here to make sure that that happens as soon as we can get in there. And that's Mika Faitari, the MP for Ikaro Rafiti, speaking to Bridget Burke. Well, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un will make history tomorrow when they become the first sitting leaders of the US and North Korea to meet in person. On the agenda, addressing North Korea's nuclear weapons program and much more, with the hope of achieving peace on the Korean Peninsula. Anna Fifield is in Singapore for the Washington Post, where the summit is being held amid tight security. I spoke to her a short time ago via Skype video and began asking what the two leaders are doing today. We've got uh, Kim Jong-un. We don't know what he's doing. He's presumably still at his hotel because we haven't seen his motorcade leave. But Donald Trump is going in for a meeting with Singapore's prime minister. But that's all he's got on his schedule too. So they both seem to be very much in preparation mode. They are um, getting ready for the big day tomorrow. And it seems to be quite unclear what the outcome might be tomorrow. Have there been any hints coming out today about that? It's been very tightly held. We've got no details about whether they've been able to agree to anything fundamental or substantial on denuclearization. But uh, the atmospherics are certainly very good. So this morning in the North Korean state media, they, you know, the, the newspaper had two full color pages, the front page showing Kim Jong-un getting on the plane, going off to Singapore, and it said, that he was going for a historic meeting with the American president and they were starting a, you know, a new era in their relationship. And to me, that was very significant because Kim Jong-un is telling that to his own people. He's beginning to prepare them for a change in the nature of the relationship. Instead of calling the Americans, you know, jackals who are out to destroy them anymore, he's saying, you know, maybe we can improve this relationship. So Kim Jong-un seems very eager. Donald Trump has been saying that he's looking forward to it. And in fact, when they start the meeting tomorrow morning, they will actually go in for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, just them and their translators, no aides or experts or anything like that. And the White House is saying they might talk for two hours, just the two of them together like that. So this is very much about making a personal connection, you know, as, um, as Donald Trump would say, a getting to know you meeting. And is that what it will take uh, for the meeting to be deemed a success or are people looking for more out of it? Well, yeah, people are looking for more, but in terms of the two leaders and what they want, I think the fact that the meeting even happens is a propaganda victory for both of them. They can both say that they have done this historic thing that neither of their successors have ever done, that they are paving the way for this diplomatic process to start and for talks about normalizing the relationship about you know the nuclear program and economic relief so it's they're both i think going to um talk about this as the start of a, pro a process you know donald trump reality tv star is clearly looking at this as the pilot of uh, you know the SC episode one of the se uh, season of talks with north korea you know this is going to carry on and play out over the next month and perhaps years but uh, i mean it seems like they're off to a good start and what about Singapore itself? You know, what are you seeing and what's the vibe of the place with this meeting happening there? Yeah, so the security is very tight around the venues where they're staying. Um, the Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are in different hotels, but not that far from each other. And then there's a third hotel on this uh, resort island where there's a Universal Studios of all things. And that's where the summit will actually be held. So it's very, very tight security there, huge motorcades. But I was really struck yesterday that to get to his hotel, Kim Jong-un had to go through one of Singapore's, you know, swankiest uh, shopping districts, all these very fancy luxury shops and people out there. And, you know, I, I wonder if he looks at this and think, you know, maybe, maybe North Korea could have a little bit, just a little bit of this one day. And are people sort of trying to crowd around to get a glimpse of them? Yeah, they are. So there's been big throngs outside Kim Jong-un's uh, hotel in particular, people waiting for like three hours in the sun yesterday. Uh, you couldn't even see him. He was inside his black uh, stretch Mercedes Benz the whole time and you know he drove into an underground or covered area so we couldn't see him but there's so much uh, mystery you know he's such an enigma to the outside world we know so little about him that uh, you know everybody was hoping just to get a little glimpse of him but um, and then we did see the footage when he went to see the Singaporean Prime Minister last night and he was very much in charm offensive mode he was smiling and laughing and, you know, seem to be into this process. And that is Anna Fifield talking to us from Singapore ahead of that historic US-North Korea summit.
Well, Australia's former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce has again appeared on commercial TV across the Tasman, this time renewing his calls for a change to the privacy laws. And the call comes after a series of complaints from Mr Joyce, who blames the media for hounding him out of his office over an affair with one of his staff, with whom he now has a baby. Last week he was in the gun for taking 150000 Australian dollars for a TV tell-all. This week he's back on his old theme, media invasion of privacy. The ABC's Sarah Sedgi has the details. For a man who's repeatedly called for his privacy to be respected, Barnaby Joyce seems more than willing to put himself in front of the camera. Speaking to Channel 7's Sunrise program this morning, he's repeated his call for a privacy tort. But he says it's not for his sake, but to better protect private individuals. For public people like myself, I understand that you're a public figure yeah. and there's an expectation that you're going to be part of the media. We get that. But for private individuals, I think they deserve a greater protection so that they don't, can live their life um, uninterfered uh, and not be harassed over a long period of time, which is what I've seen now in close circumstance with uh, Vicky and, and Seb. This is not something that's happened over a day. It's happened, something that's happened over months, now over half a year. Yeah. And I think there comes a point where there's got to be a greater protection than what we've got because they've got no protection. You can't use defamation, you can't go to the press council. None of these things have any effect. The media appearance follows an altercation Mr Joyce had at the weekend with a photographer as he left church. He posted the exchange on Twitter. But what's your, who do you work for? How can you seriously come who out of church for, who do you work and for? size someone up who to do you punch work them? For? I didn't size you up to punch Yes, you did. No, no, that's you, put, what you, you pulled your right hand back and oh, you were, if I hadn't you. actually walked away, you would have clubbed that's me. Great. Well, why are you doing this? Seriously. What's your name? It's been a week now since Channel 7 aired an interview featuring Mr Joyce and his partner Vicky Campion. Barnaby Joyce says that he and Ms Campion agreed to do a paid interview with commercial media in the hopes of having their privacy respected and that despite efforts until then, the privacy of he and his family had been violated. Mr Joyce might not like being harassed outside church, but he's not in favour of a bill just passed by the New South Wales Parliament to implement safe access zones around abortion clinics. The changes will see punishments including jail time for people who intimidate, harass or film women outside clinics. Can you understand a lot of viewers are saying, hey, Barnaby, you lobbied the New South Wales National MPs to vote against a bill protecting women outside of abortion clinics. You've, you've copped a, a lot of heat sure. online. Many see this as double sure. standards. What's the difference? I, I, well, if we had a proper tort of privacy, that would protect people going to clinics, absolutely, because you wouldn't be able to go up and harass somebody. It would be a much better protection okay. than saying, so you're well, changing stand back your tune on this meters. now because you're, you've experienced no, I'm not. it. I've always, no, I've, what I've, I've, what people know my position. I've always been a pro lifer. People know that. But I'm saying that even a restriction is not the proper protection. A tort of privacy would give you that protection. And that is the former Australian Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce ending that report from Sarah Sedgi. And we just have an update now on the very latest on the bad weather expected to hit around the country tonight from the Met Service meteorologist Lisa Murray. Uh, she tells us that Taupo, Manawatu, Taihape, Whanganui, Kapiti Coast, Horafenua have been upgraded to a severe wind warning, while Taumaranui has been added to a severe wind watch. The heaviest rainfall is expected on the eastern coast, where the Met Service says there could be about 220 millimetres in the rain which will affect the areas, uh, the already sodden Gisborne area, including Atolaga Bay. Tauranga and New Plymouth can expect very strong winds from different directions as the low goes by, combined with heavy persistent rain. And Aucklanders can expect a windy overnight period, especially for Waiheke and Great Barrier Islands, with several spells of rain. Uh, but thanks to sheltering from the Coromandel, neither wind nor rain is expected to reach warning levels. And the Met Service is urging people to monitor its website for the latest updates. Well, into the US again now, where the largest actors union and the four major television networks have agreed to limit auditions in private hotel rooms and homes following the Me Too uproar. Lisa Bernhard from Reuters has the story. 
The Me Too movement taking strides toward eliminating one of the most notorious Hollywood institutions, the so-called casting couch. The largest U.S. actors union, SAG-AFTRA, and the four major television networks agreeing to limit auditions in private hotel rooms and homes. Disgraced Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein is alleged to have arranged these sorts of meetings with actresses and then soliciting sex or engaging in abuse. That this defendant used his position, money, and power to lure young women into situations where he was able to violate them sexually. More than 80 women have accused Weinstein of sexual misconduct. Weinstein denies having non-consensual sex with anyone. The demands by the Actors Union are part of a tentative three-year contract renewal between the group and ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. SAG after President Gabrielle Carteris, best known for her role on the 90s TV series Beverly Hills 90210, said the contract's new language, quote, represents a partial realization of our work toward industry culture change. Weinstein is facing trial for criminal charges of rape and sexual assault. He has pled not guilty. And that is Checkpoint for this evening. Thanks for joining us on your radio, your TV, online or however you chose to connect with us today. You can catch up on all our stories tonight on rnz.co.nz slash Checkpoint or on our Facebook page. So from me, Rowan Quinn and the Checkpoint team, have a lovely night and stay warm. RNZ News headlines now at half past six. A victim rights advocate is congratulating New Zealand First for spiking the repeal of the three strikes law. Damage caused by last week's heavy rain near Tolaga Bay to be declared a medium scale adverse event as the region prepares for more wild weather. New Zealand troops will remain in Afghanistan till at least the end of September. Commuters who try to dodge fares on Auckland's trains could soon face fines of up to $500. Kim Jong-un will discuss a permanent peacekeeping mechanism when he meets with Donald Trump tomorrow and a lifeline could be on the way for a cancelled air service between Parapara Umu and Auckland. Our next news and weather will be at 7. Hey! Worlds of Music is a world music programme with a difference. Every week we present an eclectic mix of world music, fusion and folk roots from all over the planet. The program includes a variety of artists, interviews and musical curiosities. An hour of